12 criminal cases. That's the number of cases that have been filed against former Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. A murder of a grocery shop owner killed in a police shooting on July 19 for the deaths of students in the police firing. The kidnapping of a lawyer in 2015. There's a pile of such cases that have been built up against her. And finally, there's an investigation against 10 people, including the former Prime Minister, for murder, torture and genocide during the student-led protests. Are these cases being filed to seek her extradition? And if so, what will this request mean for India and Indo-Bangladesh relations? To talk about this, I'm joined by Ambassador Anil Trigunyat and geopolitical expert Chireyu Thakkar. Gentlemen, welcome to the News 9 Plus show. Ambassador Trigunyat, you know, New Delhi and Dhaka have this extradition treaty in place for more than a decade. And this treaty, basically it was, basically it was put into motion just to extradite militants who were sheltering in Bangladesh, militant organizations focused on India. Now, this doesn't extend to the case of political asylum seekers, we know that. But in the political asylum seekers itself, you cannot ask for political asylum if you are charged of criminal cases of the kind that have been filed against Sheikh Hasina in the last few days. There are a dozen cases that the government has brought against her. Now, you know, what's your take on this? Do you feel that these cases are being built up? There's a case that's being built up to extradite Sheikh Hasina back to Bangladesh. Well, thank you, Sandeep. It is uh, still a lot of gray area there. In the first place, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, the political asylum cases are not covered in this directly, uh, but the criminal cases definitely are. And that whole purpose of that treaty was because during that time, Bangladesh uh, used to uh, give, uh, I mean, there were several militant groups that were operating out of that, which Sheikh Hasina eventually controlled. Now, this is, uh, so far she has not sought political asylum in India. She is still continues to be the guest uh, here and looking for some asylum somewhere. Now, we don't know exactly where will it uh, play out. But theoretically, as you rightly mentioned, that these cases which are coming up uh, at 12 now, and I think there will be many more that will be eventually filed. And uh, it has to go through the legal process in Bangladesh in the first place. And if you remember, the acting foreign minister had made a comment on this, yes. who used to be at one time foreign secretary during uh, for BNP government. And he said that if the, your legal authorities ask for extradition, we'll request for extradition. Right. Now, um, it is still a way ahead because, as you know, that we have been trying to get Malaya for several years now, Nira yes. Modi, Zanadas, they are all under the extradition treaty. Right. And it has not worked out. I remember that when we, I was looking after the Middle East in the foreign ministry, we tried to get some people from UAE and uh, those people were never sent back. But today things have changed a great deal. So it all depends how things work out. But for the moment, and on the other hand, you know that we have this history of looking after our guests. The Dalai Lama has been yes, here ever since. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask and, you that uh, Afghan, next. Yes. <laughs> yeah, even Afghan uh, president's family, everybody was here. Right. So, if this is something It all depends on the way things move, which are the kind of governments. And secondly, I mean, in these cases, what happens is the formal request is made. Yes. And that request is then, I mean, you know, that with Pakistan, what I've been doing, 9-11, 26-11, people are still, <laughs> nobody has taken right. any charge right. of that. Secondly, we'll have to see is that what is the concrete evidence that is provided that is again vetted within the Indian legal system. She'll, of course, have a... a Stay here as well. Thirdly, it depends on uh, to what extent the Indian government uh, would be wanting to comply with that request, because uh, yes. there are always legal, uh, you know, a lot of legal loopholes. And I don't think that uh, uh, in the routine course, either they will ask for her extradition or India will provide that extradition. Right. Absolutely. Neither will Bangladesh ask for that extradition, nor will India. Uh, uh, you know, uh, accede, uh, accede to those requests. And uh, as uh, Ambassador Trigunyat pointed out, India has a long history of uh, house guests like the Dalai Lama, who was uh, given sanctuary here for now six decades almost. But 
Chirayu, I want to ask you this. What are the next steps going to be for Sheikh Hasina? She's in India for the last nearly two weeks now. Uh, she's not released any statements so far. What do you think her next steps are going to be? Where would she head out, possibly to a country which has no extradition treaty with Bangladesh, you think? Sandeep, uh, good afternoon and thank you for having me. I think, first of all, uh, she is perhaps the safest in India. Right. Uh, and uh, I think uh, extradition treaty means nothing. Uh, first of all, uh, as Ambassador Trigunia has rightly mentioned, uh, this is always on a case-to-case -case basis. Second, even if they find her culpable, which is a long judicial process even in Bangladesh, let's assume that they find her culpable in the uh, murder of a grocery store that happened by a policeman who was under her control. Uh, taking that to the political executive at the top is, uh, you know, by any stretch of imagination, it's a difficult precedence to set because courts, if they set the precedent today, then they have to apply that precedent again and again and again. So that is not going to happen. Even if it happens, they send a letter rogatory to uh, our country and here the second level of judicial scrutiny happens. So I think uh, India would want not like an albatross hanging around our neck because if the new regime comes and settles down completely well, then yes. it might political conflict between us and Dhaka and uh, India would give her time uh, to go and find another uh, place where India doesn't have that sort of a political problem, but India would continue to support. And look, Sandeep, it is important to give political signals in a climate around our neighborhood where we do not have many friends that if you stand up for India's causes, if you would be India's friends, yes. this establishment is going to protect you, whether you are sitting in a corner in New Delhi or, or uh, in the surrounding, or you are in the UAE, a friendly country to us, we are going to take care of you. So right. I think that political signal is very important nor should we be in a hurry to push her out and if she wants to make a comeback at a given point in time then she has to plan her moves accordingly if she wants to go into political wilderness she can make her plans accordingly but i think this extradition thing means nothing absolutely uh, uh, you know it means nothing but there's an important point that you raised chirayu and i'm going to ask ambassador trigunyat this uh, ambassador trigunyat this point that chirayu mentioned of india signaling to the world at large that friends of India, India will stand by its friends, you know, when the when push comes to shove. And this seems to be a test case for that. We had that a couple of uh, years back in the Maldives as well, when one of, uh, pro with President yes. Nasheed, uh, well, uh, he was being persecuted by the, uh, you know, the regime that took over after him. But tell us the importance of for India to stand by Sheikh Hasina. I mean, as you correctly mentioned, I mean, India has stood up to China over the issue of the Dalai Lama as it continues to do so for several decades now. Why is the case of Sheikh Hasina a peculiar one, given that this is 2024, you have a rising India that needs to be taken very seriously when it comes to you know uh, geopolitics, especially of the region? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with Chirayu about this. And I think that uh, you know, it, it, we have to look at it from India's point of view. We have, we always say that uh, we stand for the people of Bangladesh or people of our neighborhood and uh, whatever happens. And in that process, whoever is a leader, they, they, we work through them. I mean, that is essentially the current policy of the government. Is. In effect, it happens that you are working more closely with that person because that person happens to be uh, in the government for 15 years. But semantics and symbolism are also very, very important uh, in diplomacy. Now, would you like to buckle under uh, just because there is an inimical regime which is there and wants to make a point of it? I mean, that is a call that the government will have to make it. And I doubt very much that it will be in the affirmative. Because frankly, uh, let us say, presume that BNP comes to power tomorrow. Of course, the students themselves are looking for uh, an alternate, and maybe they will form right. their own party, which might be very different. Uh, but let us presume then BNP is obviously not quite well disposed towards India. In any case, there are these relationships. Uh, we have a old history. We have a problem which we had seen. We will see that uh, Pakistan would become far more active in a different way. Uh, uh, the you will have security issues that will be telling upon you, and uh, but. In my view, the thing is that as far as Sheikh Hasina is concerned, uh, we'll have to find a way out if you don't want to completely displease the population of Bangladesh because see, right. at that moment, uh, nobody is there. You have to convey a message that you stand for the people of that country, not necessarily yes. a particular leader. 
right. even if that is the intent. And therefore, I think that uh, maybe we'll, she might even go to Saudi Arabia. Saudi, every single leader of the world, Islamic world, has been in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Taken. Saudi Arabia doesn't care to hoots for it, even though we may have a treaty with them or this that. So political uh, cases are treated very differently. And uh, I think that there is a, a very uh, important calculation that is made at a particular point in time. Right. Political cases are treated very differently. And Chirayu, uh, you know, our reporter was on the ground in Dhaka and uh, there was actually a, a lot of people that he spoke to, uh, you know, common people, the student, uh, student protesters especially, they were very upset by the fact that uh, Sheikh Hasina was given shelter, you know, in India and the fact that they kept pointing at this, saying that, you know, this is not good for relations between India and Bangladesh. But, you know, so at least in the short term, it seems pretty likely that Sheikh Hasina could go to another country, a third country, possibly Saudi Arabia, as Ambassador Trigunyat mentioned. What are the chances of that actually happening? You know, Saudi Arabia or UAE. In the past, Saudi Arabia sheltered Nawaz Sharif when he was on the run from uh, persecution in Pakistan. So, Sandeep, I think what is the shadow of time uh, that uh, New Delhi, uh, particularly the Mandarins in the South Block, uh, they are uh, framing their calculus based on. I think that is the most important point. If you are right. about everything about short term, then I think it is not wise to keep say Kashina here. If you are thinking about medium to long term, uh, then you are, uh, you know, your calculus will be different. Also, Sandeep, I as a political scientist, I have never been a huge fan of, uh, you know, people going onto the streets and uh, shoving mics into people's face and what do you think of this? What do you think of that? People's memories are very short. Right. In, a, in, in matters of weeks and months, opinion change like anything. Uh, uh, you remember on your show, uh, we discussed this last week and previously on Karthik show when this new government was sworn in. The new government does not have magic wands. A most important grouse that people of Bangladesh right now have is economic in nature. Yes. And do you think this bunch of civil society activists that are right now sworn in, they understand policy, politics and economics that well that they'll put things into order. Third, as Ambassador was mentioning right now, the students are not very enchanted with the Islamists in the country. They want their own political outfit. They want a Gen Z revolution to happen. Right. So I don't think that there is a super alignment, there are chips. And remember what happened in Maldives. Maldives, you had even a bitter version of this on the streets. Yes. And eventually, both the government and the people changed because you as a hegemon of the South Asian region have more chips with you compared to the other side. They are now welcoming India's role. So I think if you are going to give this disproportionate weightage to the opinion on the streets, yes. your policy will be very different compared to sagacity that you will think uh, bring from a medium to long term perspective. Absolutely. No, I was just giving you a sense of what the uh, voices on the street are. I mean, uh, I'm fully aware of the fact that, you know, public memory is really short and possibly you go there two or three weeks later, there'll be something else on their minds, like the economic situation that uh, uh, the Ambassador Trigunyat mentioned and of course you spoke of as well. But Ambassador Trigunyat, you know, coming back to Bangladesh, what are India's short term, medium term and long term interests in this, in, in the country and what's going on right now? Well, I think in the short term and medium term and long term, one of the key interests for India is that the country should become stable yes. and uh, secure. That is the most important thing. Uh, because stability in Bangladesh, even in the short term, immediately, is of utmost importance. Because if they are able to do that, then only they can move forward. Uh, secondly, in the medium term, I think that we will have to review uh, our policy of uh, whether we are going to continue to work with uh, one political party, multiple political parties, or uh, various stakeholders in that country. And as Shirayu mentioned, I mean, you look at uh, what we have been doing. I mean, people might criticize India's neighborhood first policy, yes. but frankly, it is a non-reciprocal policy that has paid off dividends for everyone. Right. And that's precisely the reason whether it is Afghanistan, Taliban in Afghanistan, whether it is Sri Lanka or uh, Nepal, or for that matter, Maldives. The countries initially, uh, they were anti-India rhetoric, which was going on on the streets yes. and among the leadership. But then they realized the reality of the uh, of their own existence and the national right. interest. And so they come back. I mean, this is precisely what is going to happen in Bangladesh, even though one must grant that the Bangladeshi people, especially the youth, the students, yes. are a volatile. 
and they are very, uh, I mean, they, they, all the revolutions that have happened, 29 or so, or suppose and what now, yeah. they have been removed by the student agitations and that's yes. precisely uh, likely to happen. But today they are looking at it, they are not enchanted by Awami League, they are not enchanted by the BNP or the jamaat islami and all that. So it is very likely that there could be another front that might come up and uh, could perhaps um, uh, try to lead the country in a different way. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, rise of a third front, and this is a story that we've actually been debating on the News 9 Plus show as well over the last couple of installments, the fact that the students could actually band together and form a political party of their own. Uh, that remains to be seen how successful it will be given the track record of such political parties. But uh, for the moment, the story that we are focusing on is extraditing Sheikh Hasina, the Bangladesh interim government building up a whole wall of cases against Sheikh Hasina pointing to the possibility that they might actually seek to extradite her for trial, possibly to divert public attention, the pl public sympathy, um, all of those that we've been just speaking on with our uh, esteemed panelists. But thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening, Ambassador Trigunyat, Chirayo Thakur. This is a story that we'll be following very closely. Over 400 people dead, three villages wiped out, that's the toll from Wayanad in Kerala. But today we are zooming out to look at the big picture, the Western Ghats. Wayanad is part of a mountain range that's over 1,600 kilometers long. That's longer than the distance between Delhi and Mumbai. The Western Ghats cover an area of 160,000 square kilometers. That's an area the size of the state of Andhra Pradesh. And this region is one of the eight hottest hotspots of biodiversity in the world. But today, the Western Ghats are under sustained attack. They are being ripped apart, plundered by rampant commercialization. Nearly half of the forests of the Western Ghats have been stripped off in the last four decades. And it's leading to tragedies like this in Wayanad. Why are these warnings being ignored? Joining me to talk about this, are my colleague Nivriti Mohan, who's just made a short documentary on the aftermath of this disaster. And also with me is Mr. Joseph Hoover, an environmentalist from Bengaluru. Welcome to the News 9 Plus show. Thank you. Mr. Hoover, I want to start by asking you this. Could those 400 persons in Wayanad, could they have been saved if the warnings had been heeded to? The warnings of the Western Ghats, being extremely fragile and the fact that you didn't need to build houses, commercially exploit the forests of the Western Ghats. Give us your thoughts on this. Definitely. These lives, precious lives could have been saved. The tra trauma for the families could have been saved. But the uh, governments, be it just Kerala or Karnataka or Maharashtra, whoever it is, they were up against Madhav Gadgil's uh, yes. uh, the, the ASA allocations. You have clearly said there are three zones, one, two, and three. And then they said these are areas, especially in Vainad, was coming under the category one, yes. ESA one. And he had defined that there's going to be trouble if we do not take proper caution. Despite his warnings, the government did nothing. I mean, we cannot blame the central government in this because it's a state uh, Absolutely. issue. Absolutely, it's a state is, subject. Absolutely. Yeah, state subject. So it was the responsibility of the Kerala government to ensure their people were safe. So I would definitely blame the, uh, the Kerala chief minister and all his colleagues for letting their own people down. Right. This area has always been fragile. I mean, we're talking about this for the last 30 years. We're saying right. there's going to be a lot of issues. And especially after the report was given, uh, uh, Gargil's report was given, people went against them because people were told that their old properties would go, their livelihood would be uh, taken away, yes. and their houses had to be painted green. It was all, they were all misled. One is the bureaucracy failed to inform the people. Second, the forest department, the forest officers failed to tell the people that this was not the case. But the politicians used this to their advantage because they had huge swathes of land there. They had land holdings there. So they used the public, the poor public, the vulnerable public 
to ride on the shoulder to protect their own properties because they had invested big. Yes. So, when you look at it, uh, this was bound to happen. And when when the Kasturi report, uh, Kasturi Rangan report came in, yes. the second committee report was made, even there people objected. And Kerala, 11,000 square kilometers of uh, forest land was supposed to be under the ESA. They reduced it to 9,800. Yes. Subsequently, it reduced to about 7,193, yes. if right. I got my figures right. So you can see that they knew what was happening. Yes. But they did nothing about it. They knew what One was happening and they did nothing the... about it. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Hoover, I'm going to ask Nivriti about this now. Nivriti, what's the status of these ESAs that uh, Mr. Hoover mentioned? You know, there are. Uh, we've read reports of uh, one of the high courts of Maharashtra literally calling out the state government for not implementing the e ESAs. Why have they been stuck so far? Look, if you talk about ESAs, uh, you are aware that government, the central government has yes. also been issuing notification in this regard. And right. the notification that was issued, the recent notification after one day of the disaster, yes. which was issued by the central government, it is the fifth notification in this right. regard. There have been issued. five such notifications yes. that have been issued. Yes, this is the fifth one. Right. And nothing has happened on... Uh, the other uh, previous four uh, yes. notifications as such because right. the government uh, also objected to uh, declaring the area as eco-sensitive zone they wanted to reduce uh, the area that should be declared as eco-sensitive because people uh, the residents of the area also didn't want that right. entire area as mentioned in the guard gill committee report mm. because they had asked about six for about sixty percent of the area should be declared as uh, eco sensitive eco sensitive area yes. of the western guards right but the local people uh, the people who reside in the area they don't want uh, this to happen because yes uh, because of the economic benefits that they are getting from the area right. their plantations that they have made the tourism industry that yes. is flourishing right. the high uh, construction which is happening there right. so this is also the lack of awareness on the part of uh, the residents local right. people people right. of the state and the local government supporting uh, what people want right absolutely so that's what uh, the point that mr hoover made the fact that you know irrespective of the political party that's in power in the state all of them seem to be united on this one topic that we are not to bring uh, you know, any of these lands under the ESA because that means that you can't, as you said, there are a lot of vested interests that have invested in these, uh, uh, you know, regions and they wouldn't want that ESA tag there because it prevents them from exploiting the land. But, you know, there is also the larger issue, uh, Mr. Hoover, the fact that a climate change has accelerated a lot of the degradation that we're seeing right now. Uh, you know, while the Madhav uh, Gargil Committee, that was more than two decades yeah. ago, that suggested all of this. Now it is literally the houses on fire, right? I mean, you're looking at a global warming on a scale that's not been seen before. You're seeing climate change. It's a reality today. You know, give us an idea of the fact that given the rate of degradation of the Western Ghats, we've spoken to experts, including yourself, for Nivriti's story in which she... Uh, where, where they mention the fact that 40%, 45% in fact, of the Western Ghats have been in the denuded Kaveri in the last yeah. four decades. That was in, in the Kaveri Basin. Yes. yes. And, you know, given this rate of degradation of the Western Ghats, we have states that are slowly clearing forest land and they are, uh, you know, making a way for resorts and for mining and for road projects. And how long do you think the Western Ghats will last, actually? If we continue destroying it, I think it will not take us less than, I mean, not more than 20 years to destroy the entire thing. Because My God. it's all anthropogenic. We are not worried about the future generations. We are only right. worried about what can we achieve out of it. Our GDP goals and ensuring the rich become richer and the vulnerable die. So once we have this kind of agenda, it becomes very difficult. The way I have seen it, I mean, my own eyes, what I saw about 10 years ago, those parts have disappeared. Right. And we've been on the job, we've been on foot, on ground, 
talking to people, talking to authorities' concerns, saying that please leave our forests alone. You do your development. We want our country to be a superpower. We want India to be the best in the world. No yes. doubt about that. Not yeah. a modicum of doubt of that. But we are saying, we have just been begging them virtually, saying yes. that please leave our forests alone. It's all too fragile. Right. Not mess around with that. Yes. So we have pleaded, we have begged, we have written to the Prime Minister, we have written to the Ministry of Environment and Forests, right. we have written to everybody who is concerned with the environment. Now, but what have we got? Stubbornness. They don't care. They don't listen to us. Mm. For them, it's just a thing that they've decided and they go about it. When we went to court on a couple of occasions, saying that our forests, our Western Guards are being destroyed, right. you know the kind of resistance we got? I mean, they blamed us, they called us names, they called us anti-nationals. And we said, no, we are not anti-nationals. We are interested in our country. We want the best for our country. And you, even if you name us, whatever you want, you want to come after us, we are ready to face all these consequences to protect our Western guards. Now, as I say, like if you look at what happened to the NH4A between Belgaum and Goa, they destroyed the Hanshi Tiger Reserve part of Dandeli uh, Reserve. It's a huge, it's one of the pristine areas. It's the last area where the tiger, our magnificent tiger can survive. Right. They just went about destroying it. And then they started destroying the Castle Rock area. They wanted a double lane uh, a train uh, railway thing to be done so that they could bring in the goods from uh, the port into the interland of Karnataka, Bellari and uh, uh, Ospete and then take the iron ore out of that place. So we were saying, please, to have the railway line up to Thinegat, where from Hubli to Thinegat, they had the facility, double line. Why are you destroying this? But they didn't care. Fortunately, we all together went to the Supreme Court, led by Goa Foundation, yes. and there we got a decent order where the CEC said, you cannot do this anymore. You'll be destroying the entire ecosystem there. Luckily, that is on hold. But when you come again, what has the Karnataka government did? We were blaming yes. Kerala. Look at what the Karnataka government is doing. Vaynard is just an example of what's, what, what happened and what could happen. Right. We are seeing it. It's being reflected. And we know what kind of calamities we're being faced with. But despite that, the Karnataka government is ready to take up a project a pump storage uh, project in the uh, pristine uh, uh, Western Ghats called the Sharavati Lion Tail Macaque Wildlife Sanctuary. It's got the Miristika Swamp. It's one of the view most beautiful areas you could visit. And they're going ahead with one pump storage uh, project to uh, generate 2000 megawatts of power. That same thing could be done through renewable energy at a lesser right. price. Right. Cleaner energy. But the, for, the Minister for Energy in Karnataka makes a statement that we'll ensure that the nothing will happen to the forest. We are talking about 1,052 hectares of forest right. being uh, destroyed. And this right. gentleman, he makes a statement saying that we'll ensure nothing happens there. How could he make such a statement? Right. I've been there. I've been on the spot. Absolutely. I've got the uh, GPS readings. I know wh where they're going to do that. Right. They're going to generate power from a lower, uh, pump water from a lower dam, pump it up, and then generate power. That is just costing a lot. Absolutely. Then no, again, this is just one more example, uh, Mr. Hoover, of the fact that how uh, you know the Western Guards continue to be under uh, you know uh, attack, uh, as your documentary has brought out, Nivriti. But uh, give us an idea of how. Indian states are landslide prone and where does Kerala really fit in all of this since we're talking about Vainard give us a sense of how Kerala is literally the ground zero of landslide country in India of course as we have discussed yes. the Kerala is the ecologically sensitive area right and uh, ecologically sensitive area because 70% uh, of it is in Western falls in Western yes. parts yes. and uh, 28% of the entire Western Ghats is in uh, 
Kerala. That means 70 percent of Kerala is ecologically sensitive and right. it should be taken care of. And if we go through the figures, then you will find out that in last two years, there is a figure which says that 500 landslides took place in Kerala right. alone. And uh, according to a figure that was uh, placed in Lok Sabha, uh, it mentions about seven years data of landslides and it says that more than 2,200 something landslides happened in Kerala alone. alone. Uh, uh, and the total number of landslides in 16 states, which includes the Himalayan states, northeastern states, uh, and northern states of India, uh, the total number was around 3,800 or something. So, about, uh, out of 3,800, 2,200 uh, landslides were in Kerala alone. So, that in itself describes how prone Kerala is and how negligent we are uh, and how indifferent we are. We can uh, say this because in 2019 yes. also, the landslide happened in the same place. In the same place, right. And now the crown has become bigger. It is yes. around 86,000 square. What is the crown? It, it is us. around 86,000 square What meters. is the crown? It is the the part of land that comes down oh, right. from okay. the mountain. Yes. So, the crater that it has created, it is around 86,000 square meters right. now. Right. And it has happened at the same uh, location where it happened in 2019. 19. And then also it was said... Warnings were uh, ignored. Yeah, yes. warnings were ignored. It was said that uh, you should um, empty this area. Right. There should be no uh, people here, no uh, residents should yes. be living here. But it was ignored and look now what yeah, has happened. Yeah, look what's happened. Mm. Warnings ignored again. I'm going to right. ask Mr. Hoover this. Uh, you know, Mr. Hoover, we've been hearing about how the Arabian Sea is heating up. Literally all of the oceans, the world's oceans are heating up. But in our vicinity, it's the Arabian Sea that's, you know, that uh, basically hosts the monsoon. It's a very crucial part of our ecosystem. Uh, you know, give us an idea of how the heating Arabian Sea has altered climate patterns and its possibility of triggering of landslides like what we saw in Wayanad is extremely, uh, you know, it, it could happen uh, with great frequency now along the Western Ghats. See, when we talk about uh, sea, the sea, uh, if you look at it, this, the sea water is rising. The seas are rising, it's taking over land in Kerala, either on the east coast and the west coast. Uh, sea water is seeping in. So definitely, because of salination, nothing can be grown there. A lot of houses are being destroyed, people are moving out, people want to sell, nobody is buying. So that is the scenario today. If you look at why we are in a scenario like this, this is because of basically climate change. And scientists have been telling, talking about this for a very long time and giving figures, graphic figures saying this could happen, this, be prepared for this kind of thing. At one point of time, we were a little relaxed when somebody said 2050 is when we could see things going bonkers, right. things going right. berserk. So yes. we took it comfortably and said, oh, there is still time. Right. But later, one more estimate came in scientific uh, thing. They said 2030 is when things could hit us. Then later, somebody revised it to 2027. But we have seen this happen in 2022, 2023, 2024. And it's worsening. It's worsening indeed. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, warnings like Weinard are obviously something that we cannot ignore, given the fact that, as Nivriti just pointed out, two landslides, two massive landslides in the same spot right. in five five years apart. And that, that is the kind of warning that uh, nature seems to be giving us, that there is a limit to uh, our greed and our commercialization of all these areas, especially the Western Ghats. But, that's the warning that we've been talking about for so long and uh, this is a story that we've been tracking and uh, thank you very much for joining us Mr. Hoover, my colleague Nivriti Mohan about the Vinard warning and why we should worry, why we should pay note to all of these things that are happening around us given the fact that global warming is now a reality. The house is on fire and this, these are warnings that we can neglect only at our peril.